Hi there and welcome to a new episode of Impact Talks. Today we have Aubrey de Grey, Chief Science Officer at Sense Research Foundation and author of Ending Aging. He's uh, an anti-aging expert and I'm super excited to have him on the podcast. Uh, we're going to be discussing tech and startups and everything in between around uh, anti-aging. Aubrey, please introduce yourself to our guests and how might they know you? Well, thank you for having me on the show. Yes, that's right. I'm the Chief Science Officer of Sense Research Foundation, which is a 501c3 public charity based in Silicon Valley. And what we do is we're interested in developing new therapies that will bring aging under genuine comprehensive medical control. So that means not only slowing down the clock of aging that makes people progressively sicker as they get older, but actually turning the clock back, taking people who are already in middle age or older and actually rejuvenating them so that they are biologically, both mentally and physically, just like young adults for as long as they live, however long ago they were born. Now, we do really early stage work, so we are a long way away from having those therapies yet. but. If it weren't for the early stage work, it would never happen. So we believe we're doing extremely important work. Great. Um, there was a lot of uh, things that popped up, obviously, when I was research researching you. One of the things I think would be relevant to the audience is first understanding what this anti-aging thing is, because a lot of people start thinking about the fountain of youth. Those are comments as well that pop up in reviews and stuff like that. But the approach that you take is a little bit different, I've noticed. Um, you had, you know, your TED talk and everything about those. Could you quickly summarize maybe the problem that is happening around aging, how you see that problem and, uh, and maybe the steps that you've taken already? Um, sure. Well, so the first step, of course, in solving any hard problem is to define the problem properly. And actually, that's a large part of what's been missing in the discussion around aging for ever since the dawn of civilization, really. People haven't even taken the trouble to come up with a clear, rigorous, agreed definition of what aging is. And it turns out that that's not very difficult to do. Aging is simply the accumulation of self-inflicted damage to the body. So in that sense, it's really no different than aging of a simple man-made machine, like a car or whatever. Aging is just a consequence of physics, not biology. It's not some emergent phenomenon like you know consciousness or whatever. Aging consists of the progressive accumulation of changes at the microscopic level, molecular and cellular changes to the body that are generated as consequences of the body's normal operation, of the various processes that keep us alive from one day to the next. The reason that those changes are progressive is because there are no systems in the body to reverse them when they happen. And the reason we call those changes damage is because the body is only set up to tolerate a certain amount of those changes, after which, when we've got too much of them, the body starts to work less well. And that is why we get sick when we get old. So from my understanding, when I was looking into you, you focus very much on fixing the sickness that happens when you start getting older and not so much, you know, a pill that will keep you the same age. Is, is that correct to assume? We are absolutely about fixing what goes wrong with us when we get older. We want to ensure that people are still just as functional, both mentally and physically, however long ago they were born. And of course, sometimes that means actually fixing people up who have you know, already become less functional. So we are not in the business of simply slowing down the gradual decline that happens, or even stopping it. We are interested in repairing it. A thousand year uh, person, right? So as you get older, how is a person alive today? How can they live a thousand years? Isn't there like a limit uh, maybe to your brain or something like that or your body? Right. So if we 
look at the press on this, the, what, what the media tend to talk about, they focus enormously on longevity. They say, oh, Aubrey de Grey says people are going to live to a thousand and so on. And, you know, that's all very well. I mean, I, sometimes I'm misquoted, but by and large, no. Um, but the main thing is that longevity is simply a side effect of staying healthy. You know, if you look at the, the causes of death that we see in the developed world today, um, most of it revolves around aging. 90% of people die from causes that are actually related to how long ago you were born. Even if we take the whole world, including the developing world, the number is up over, over 70% now. So, you know, it's, it, it stands to reason that if, you, if we didn't have that, you know, if we did develop medicines that could keep aging completely under control so that we didn't accumulate this damage I'm talking about, then the consequence, the side effect of that, would be that on average people would live a lot longer than they do now. And... Of course, we can look at the possibility that once people live a bit longer than they do now, let's say to 150, then new problems would emerge. So you just mentioned the possibility that maybe you know, people's brains would fill up uh, and there would be some kind of problem with how, um, how the body would work that we don't see in a currently normal lifespan. And you're quite right. There's no absolute guarantee that we can make today that that would not happen. But I'm quite happy to cross that bridge when we come to it. And furthermore, I think it's extremely likely that we will be able to cross any such bridges when we come to them faster than we come to them. In other words, we'll be able to stay one step ahead of the problem once we get the first couple of decades of additional lifespan that we're working on right now. So before we move on, quick question just out of interest that, that popped up for me. Um, I've read a lot into the anti-aging community and my question to you maybe is you've done a lot more research. What is currently believed to be the longest uh, possible natural way if people don't get sick uh, to live? I've seen something like 180 years because that's when the brain starts deteriorating completely or something like that. So what is possible? Yeah, so any such question is basically nonsense. You can't answer such a question because all such questions are based, they're predicated on some kind of assumption about what's not possible. In other words, for example, people will say that there's a, you know, people, good people, good, clever academics will publish papers saying that it looks like there's a natural limit of 120 on how long people can live. And they just do this on the basis of statistics. Now, <laughs> You know, it doesn't take very many milliseconds to notice that if you're basing something on statistics, then by definition, you're basing it on the past. And therefore, you are not counting the possibility of new medicines that haven't existed yet, and therefore that have not been applied to people in the past. Um, so again, you know, it's completely irrelevant to what we're trying to do. Anything that you might say about the brain, um, the same applies. You know, we have absolutely no idea what kinds of medicines we're going to develop that will keep the brain youthful uh, longer than it would quote naturally stay stay youthful and so you know it's meaningless yeah um that's actually a really good answer because that means that everything that is happening right now is based on the past but then you guys obviously are researching what could be the new future and then just looking at those diseases that pop up if i summarize that properly that's right Great. Um, so one of the things that popped up, which you said was, um, so what is happening is almost like a mechanical thing, like a car that drives and eventually starts rusting and, you know, things pop up. So um, one of the things that fascinated me, you said um, in one of your speeches that, you know, there are people who live super healthy and then there are people who just live their life and, you know, drink some beer and whatever. And the, the actual difference in how long you will live will be just, you know, a couple of years here and there. Is that, do you still think that? Or what is the reason that, you know, somebody who does yoga and eats super healthy and then I've seen like centenarians, like people who are 100 years plus who just smoke, went to Vietnam and stuff like that. So um, so what is your take on that? Is that is that still the case? Do you still think yep. that? So, so, so let me perhaps... Um describe what I actually think a little bit more rigorously than that. So 
Of course, it's easy to shorten your lifespan by having bad lifestyle and bad diet and so on. You know, smoking is definitely bad for you. So is getting seriously overweight. So is having a diet that's short in micronutrients and so on. Um, but what I have been trying to emphasize, which is really important, is that if you basically avoid those things, you know, if you just basically live the way your mother told you to, then you're doing more or less all you can do today. The best you can do over and above that is only a very small margin um, as a result of you know anything particularly innovative with regard to lifestyle or diet or supplements or anything. Furthermore, different things are good for different people. So even that small amount of additional um, benefit that you might get, it's hard to predict that you're actually going to get it. So, you know, I'm not knocking it. I think that every additional day that one can stay healthy is a day worth having, but it's not the holy grail. So absolutely today, it makes sense to do your best to live as long as you can, as healthily as you can. But a large part of why is so as to maximize your chances of making the cut. In other words, of living long enough to actually benefit from the therapies that don't yet exist that people like Sense Research Foundation are working on. And um, on the other spectrum of that is obviously you said, don't do the bad things, which seems pretty obvious. But on the other spectrum of that, you have, you know, ultra uh, people who are doing you know, Olympic sports or ultra running or Ironman or all these like crazy sports where they're just doing long distances, marathon runners. Um, I've seen uh, some research where doctors would say that those people, because they're pushing themselves, uh, going beyond their limits, their brain might be very functional in older ages. But then on the other side, there's your kind of hypothesis or theory I don't know where where you know it's a it's like a mechanical thing so your body can only handle so many things uh, and then it starts rusting or something like that um, so I would love your take on on if you go really crazy with your body and you do marathons and all that stuff or you do martial arts every day of your life that type of thing you know that's the other extreme is that good or bad? Are you wearing your body down and, you know, taking some years of your life? Or how does that work? Right. So, so these hypotheses are not really mutually exclusive. Um, generally, it's true that, you know, there's an aphorism, use it or lose it. So if you actually do push your body and your mind, for that matter, somewhat, then you will be doing good to your body and your mind. Then again, of course, there's always too much of a good thing. So one can always push one's body too hard. Um, you know, everybody's different. This is the fundamental thing I want to emphasize is that the only generalization we can say is that there are no generalizations, that everyone has to pay attention to their own body in order to know what works for them. So if you are built in such a way that you have a great deal of stamina and you're capable of doing ultra marathons or whatever, then it may be good for you to actually do those things. If, you, if on the other hand, you have a body that's not built for that uh, and you try, you'll probably overdo it and you'll do yourself more harm than good. So there's no simple answer. Great. So you just have to look at it. I guess we're also coming to pretty much what we discussed in our previous call before um, this recording. But um, I was very interested in you being in Silicon Valley. You are pretty much in the hub of everything that is happening. How does tech fall into this entire story? You know, what's the progress that you've been uh, doing so far? And how has tech maybe sped up that progress? Could you maybe share a little bit about that? Sure. Really, there are two answers to that question. One of them is how... Um, you know, advances in machine learning and so on are actually contributing to the research, to the to hastening the development of therapies that do better than what we have today in terms of keeping aging under control. And that's a significant thing right now. There are a number of groups, including new companies, working on exactly that. And some of them are here in Silicon Valley, as you say. And the contribution is very significant. There are very clever ways of identifying patterns in existing data, for example, in, um, and that identify ways to um, repurpose new dr old drugs, I'm sorry, to uh, 
you know, to have new benefits on especially age-related health problems. But perhaps the bigger um, intersection between tech and this anti-aging research is um, the more kind of conceptual one. Uh, when I started out in this field, I was already in my late 20s, early 30s, and for the previous several years, I had been working in tech. I'd been working in artificial intelligence research. And um, I think that certainly in the early years when I was working in gerontology, my background being from a completely different field was enormously helpful. It allowed me to look at the problem in ways that career biologists were not doing and to come up with insights and new ways of addressing it that had been overlooked by other people. And it's not just, not just me. The people that I have spoken to over the intervening 20 years, you know, about all of this, turns out the people who have a background in tech or in maths or in physics, they tend to get what I'm saying a lot more easily than career biologists or other non-mathematicians, non-engineers do. Um, I don't know why that is really, but perhaps it's just that I, uh, uh, th this is an engineering problem. You know, the body is a machine, albeit a really, really complicated machine, and intervening in it, to keep it going for longer than what it was built to last is an engineering problem. And so maybe thinking like an engineer helps a lot. Well, I mean, if you if you take that path, um, the thoughts that, that pop up in me when I start listening to that is, you look at a body, right? And a body is biological. And in general, when you have a material that is deteriorating, you kind of don't want to use that material. So the solution would be to use different materials that last longer. So wouldn't it be easier to find a solution to maybe map consciousness and transport that to a mechanical body that would last longer? So the idea of transferring our consciousness and our personality to more durable hardware, uh, it's often uh, goes by the term uploading. You know, it's a perfectly reasonable idea. But at this point, we still know so little about what, how consciousness really works that we honestly don't know whether even in theory it's possible to implement it on alternative hardware. Um, and even if we were to solve that problem and determine that that were possible, the question then of how we would transfer a given personality, a given individual, from one hardware to another is, again, an extraordinarily challenging one. There are, of course, philosophical questions around that, whether it would be the same person, you know, even if it behaved like the same person, um, things like that. So, you know, I'm all for that research, and I guess that if all else fails, that's something that I would think of as preferable to eternal non-existence. But at this point, I think we're doing so well on the boring preventative maintenance approach on this you know, poorly designed wet thing that we call the human body, um, that uh, maybe we won't need uploading. Okay, and so then maybe not uploading, but then maybe an alternative if I can keep pushing this point. Sure. Why not, especially how the bionics have increased, you know, people have now legs that run faster than actual people. So clearly there's been a lot of tech innovation within limbs and you know, uh, hearts and stuff like that, and just replacing um, what you have in your body into artificial things. So why not pump all of the money of research into just replacing your body towards things that can last longer? Okay, yes. So, I mean, this is a similar question, as you say. Um, I would generalize it and call it developing non-biological solutions to medical problems. And for sure, we've been doing that for quite a long time. I mean, glasses are uh, probably the first example, and they work pretty well, and they're pretty popular. And since then, we've developed things like cochlear implants, and we're getting to, as you say, you know, artificial limbs, artificial hearts, things like that. The versatility of such an approach, the breadth of it, is increasing all the time, especially because of miniaturization. The smaller you can make things, the more things you can apply them to. And so that's all wonderful. 
And I believe that that process will continue and we will continue to have a very substantial amount of our medical arsenal be of that nature. However, it doesn't really change the overall um, arc of research because the fact is we don't always know what's going to work and what's not going to work. In general, I think it's an extremely bad idea to put all one's eggs in one basket when it comes to research. So putting all the funding in, of medical research into non-biological solutions, I think, would be an extremely bad idea. We just don't know whether that's going to be the most effective and most efficient alternative. Yeah, makes sense. Um, maybe another question that pops up is, um, I would really just love the history, kind of. Obviously, you just said you went from tech into this what prompted you to actually go into this and and can you maybe share for the audience also what have you like done what have you researched what what has come up in all those years that you've donated towards this um can you maybe share a little bit of that story how it started and what you've done certainly so um throughout my life i've always felt that what i wanted to dedicate myself to was making the biggest difference possible to humanity. And that meant basically, you know, developing new technologies that would improve people's quality of life. Um, now, I didn't really have much idea about which particular area to go into at first when I was a young kid. But then when I was 15, I started programming, found I was good at it. And so I decided, okay, the problem I'm going to work on is the problem of work. The fact that people have to spend so much of their time doing stuff that they would not do unless they were being paid for it. Um, you know, we need more automation to give people more leisure time. And so that's what I did. As I mentioned, for several years, I worked in artificial intelligence research, having done my undergrad degree in computer science. We're talking yeah. now around the 90s, right? Well, yeah, I graduated. I got my undergrad degree in 1985. So from then until about 92 so, or so, I was working in this area. So you were working um, in AI in the 90s already? In the in the 80, in the late eighties and early nineties, that's right. Wow. Okay. Uh, you know, AI was invented in the nineteen fifties. It's it's been around a while. Um, uh, but anyway, so uh, the thing is that so I was working in it not because I thought that the problem of work was the world's most important problem, but simply because I thought it was the one where I had the expertise and the talent to make the most difference. I always knew that by far the biggest problem in the world was the problem of aging. The fact that people get sick when they get old and it kills them. Um, but I never considered myself to be a particularly talented biologist. And I knew that there were plenty of other people who were. And therefore I assumed that they would be getting on with it and doing their best to solve that problem. And I just let them. Um, now, of course, what I ought to have done was test my assumption by actually asking biologists whether they thought aging was important and interesting and generally, you know, whether they were working on it. But I didn't. I just had this assumption until while I was uh, in that phase of being a perfectly self-respecting AI researcher, I met and married a biologist. And uh, in fact, the person I married was a lot older than me. She was already a full professor, a senior professor at UC San Diego, and she was actually in England on sabbatical. Um, and through her, I first of all, you know, I learned a lot of biology that I had not been learning since I gave it up at about 15. Um, but also, I uh, gradually realized that we were never talking about aging. And I started asking questions, and it turned out that, yeah, she was actually not interested in aging at all. She said, you know, why study aging? It's just decay. You know, what fundamental truths are you going to find out about nature by studying decay? Uh, and I said, I would say, you know, um, well, sure. I mean, that's true. But, but you know, it's, it's bad for you. And, um, and she would say, well, that's not my problem. And I would say, well, it kind of is, really. And yeah, that was about as far as we would get. And it took me another couple of years after that to really come to terms with the fact that she and, of course, the other biologist that I was meeting um, took, you know, did not take aging seriously. So I decided eventually, well, I've got no choice. I've got to switch fields. My AI research was going quite well. I was quite happy with it but it just wasn't as important as fixing aging. So I switched fields. I happened to be in a very fortunate position where I had a very undemanding job that I had taken precisely in order to allow myself to support my AI research without, a, without external funding. And so all I needed to do was essentially repurpose that spare time 
to work on aging. And um, yeah, the rest is history kind of thing. In terms of the other part of your question, um, what I've mainly done, well, I guess the single thing I'm most known for is a, one big idea with a lot of like, you know, satellite ideas around it that I first put forward in the year 2000 um, after I'd been working in this space for about five years. And that idea was essentially that preventative maintenance is the way to go. So in order to explain why this was a big idea, I have to really kind of put it in context and explain what went before. So when you get sick, you know, a lot of people colloquially will say you've got this or that disease. And so, of course, people knew since a long, long time ago that there are certain aspects of health problems that happen predominantly to people who were born a long time ago. So these are age-related diseases, you know, senile dementia, as Alzheimer's used to be called, or, you know, most cancers or atherosclerosis, things like that. And so the natural thing to do was to de try to develop medicines to cure these diseases in very much the same way that we develop medicines to cure infections or other things that go wrong early in life. And yeah, that's fair enough in principle, but it didn't work. And eventually people began to realize, a few people began to realize, and I'm talking maybe a century ago now, that there was a good reason why this was not working. In fact, there were two good reasons. One was that so many things go wrong late in life and they go wrong at more or less the same time and they, you know, they interact and exacerbate each other. So it's just like the complexity is overwhelming. But they realized also that the other problem is that these are progressive issues. These are things that go wrong late in life as consequences of having been alive for a long time. And therefore, maybe, you know, it's just never going to work anyway. Anything that we try to do to eliminate these problems is going to be inherently less effective as the person gets older because they're getting older. Um, so that's where the whole field of gerontology came from. And as I say, this is more than a century ago now people started to say, well, we've got to be more preventative. We've got to try and um, stop these changes from happening in the first place that cause us to get sick. Great so far. But unfortunately, what happened was that w people went too far in that direction. What they did was they looked at the living world and they saw that there is a great deal of variation between different species in terms of how, how rapidly they age, how rapidly they accumulate damage. And so they said, well, okay, maybe we can actually study this and figure out what makes this difference between different species. And of course, it's also true to a lesser extent between different individuals of the same species. Um, so but they said, well, we'll study this really hard and eventually we'll understand it well enough that we'll be able to implement this and actually essentially make the body run more cleanly, make it you know, we would be able to delay the point at which the body starts to exhibit these age-related health problems. And that sounded like a great idea, but it also completely failed. Essentially, the reason it failed, and people began to understand this by the late 60s or 70s or so, uh, the reason it failed is because the creation of damage, the accumulation of these changes that eventually make us sick, is so inherent, so intrinsically wound up in the processes that keep us alive. And disentangling one from the other is just not happening. It's just not going to happen. And so basically people have given up. By the 70s or 80s, you know, it was essentially unacceptable if you were writing a grant application. You could not even talk about the eventual goal of doing something about aging. Aging was really something which was to be studied, to be understood, but that's all, you know, I, I, a bit like earthquakes, you know, seismologists, they understand that the thing they study is bad for you, but they um, don't have any aspiration to actually doing anything about them, right? But I uh, mean, if you use that example, seismologists know how to predict earthquakes and know exactly when it's going to arrive once they have enough, you know, waves that they pick up on. So why not continue the anti-aging to really predict when a certain disease is going to pop up? because predicting it is all very well, you'd actually like to not have it. And that, uh, so in the same way that seismologists have no way to stop earthquakes from happening, and they do not even think that that's plausible, similarly, gerontologists, by this point, 30 years ago or more, had decided that, you know, aging is just going to happen. Let's live with it. Um, 
So um, I came along and I realized that actually there was a sweet spot that was going to work better. There was a kind of um, way to avoid the reasons why just treating the diseases of aging one at a time uh, wouldn't work, and also to avoid the reasons why slowing down aging by making the body run more cleanly wouldn't work. And that was to repair the damage. So basically, as I mentioned, we've got this damage that accumulates in the body, and the body is set up to tolerate a certain amount of it without significant decline in function, which is why a bo the body of a 40 or 50-year-old is working nearly as well as the body of a 20 or 30-year-old. Um, but uh, that means we have a kind of window of opportunity. If we wait until someone's getting sick and we try to get rid of the, um, the health problem, the disease, then, you know, it's not going to happen because the thing that caused the disease, the damage that's accumulating as a side effect of being alive, is going to continue to accumulate. But if we get rid of that damage itself, then we can keep the overall amount of damage in the body down to a level that's tolerable, that is below that threshold that makes us sick in the first place. And we don't even have to be particularly complete about removing that damage. We just have to remove enough to keep the damage down below that threshold. Um, now, the other really important um, uh, selling point of this approach is that it does not require us to slow down the rate at which damage is generated in the first place. We, are, we can let the body do the creation of damage as a side effect of being alive, as in the way that it normally does. So that kind of sidesteps all of our ignorance about how the damage is created. We don't have to try to tease apart the you know, being alive from accumulating damage. We can just let it happen, and we can repair the damage afterwards. So this concept is a real paradigm shift from either of the other two approaches that came before it. Um, like any paradigm shift, it took a while to become accepted. It, uh, for the first, let's say, 10 years or so, uh, I so basically from about 2000 to 2010, I had to fight some quite intense battles with my colleagues in the community, trying to get them to understand it. Essentially, the gerontologists who were still all stuck on the idea that the only way you could even in principle um, combat aging was to make the body run more cleanly. Um, they were looking at this and saying, oh dear, this looks like a divide and conquer approach again, a kind of, uh, you know, trying to fix a lot of things all at the same time, which is why, which we know doesn't work. And they kind of didn't see that this was a different version of divide and conquer that actually avoids the problems from the geriatrics approach. Uh, is actually altogether more manageable. So, uh, the two questions popped up while you were saying that um, that attitude. You know, we're talking about a really big problem. That you know, the more we cover it, the more people are on it. The the faster we can map things. Um, why do you think there's this attitude within biologists? Um, that just they don't want to look at anti-aging. I mean, you kind of covered it saying they did some stuff and then they just accepted it. But, you know, tech has grown so much. We went from, you know, computers that filled up entire rooms to an iPhone. So, so clearly there's more tech innovation. Why didn't they revisit the problem? Why are biologists not more prone to discover more things in this? Right. So, so there is another answer which kind of complements the answer I've already given. And that is that there is a fundamental difference of mindset, not between necessarily biologists and tech people, but between basic scientists in general and tech people. Basic scientists are all about finding things out for the sake of finding things out. They're interested in understanding nature. And they often pride themselves on saying that their work is, quote, curiosity-driven, okay? So in other words, they're not doing it for the purpose of helping mankind. As far as they're concerned, yeah, great. If they discover something that ends up having humanitarian value, that's great. But it's a bonus. It's not their, it's not their focus. It's not why they're doing what they're doing. Whereas tech people are goal-directed. They're interested in taking what's known and 
pulling it together in innovative ways so as to actually have some kind of humanitarian impact. Now, you might think that there's not a lot of difference between those two things. Both of the two types of people need to have the same kinds of skills in order to explore you know, and develop new things. But it turns out it is different. It turns out it's very different. The way you use evidence, the way you interpret and um, put together what you already know is very different. Basic scientists in particular will always be highlighting and prioritizing the most direct evidence. So when they're formulating a new hypothesis and a new way to test the hypothesis, they, they want to be sure that they're not being misled by previous data into understanding you know, what hypothesis is plausible and what isn't. Whereas pioneering technology relies entirely, or very, very strongly, on something that, on leaps of faith, really, I would say, uh, on putting two and two together and making 17 and seeing how you could get more than the sum of the parts out of what you can already do. And that is completely antithetical to the way that basic scientists go about things. So the real problem with the biology of aging was that it was in this transition phase where everybody knew that, yes, it's a medical problem, right? It's something that should be addressed in a way it, by goal-directed tech types. But we understand it so poorly that maybe what we should be doing for now is just trying to understand it more. Because, of course, there is a threshold level of understanding that you have to have in order to do the goal-directed thing, right? Now... That's all very well. It's true that, you know, the more you understand, the better the chance you have of intervening. But the thing is that basic scientists, because they don't have, you know, they just don't have the concept of knowing enough. For them, that doesn't compute because they're finding things out for the sake of finding things out. So they're not very good at realizing when they might actually know enough to be able to intervene. And that's why I was able to come along with a more engineering mindset and you know, start putting two and two together in ways that other people were not doing. So how do we fix that? Because that seems like pretty much society is being held back by old traditions. Uh, I know how to phrase it in a okay, nice so, way. So, yeah, no, I can, I can answer that very clearly. So in terms of the biology community, which is what I've been talking about so far, the people who actually work in laboratories on the biology of aging, that problem is already solved. The um, advances that have been made, not just the, you know, the conceptual advance that I made 20 years ago, but the actual on-the-ground advances that have been made in laboratories all over the world, have added up to enough that the whole period of giving up on doing anything about aging has completely ended. So as I say, 20, 30 years ago, you could not mention intervention in a grant application. It was kiss of death. But now it's the exact opposite. You have to mention it, right? You are, it, is, you know, it is kind of wrong not to be thinking about intervention in aging. So that's all great. The biologists are converted. The problem is the rest of the world. We've got to actually get everybody else to wake up and realize that actually we are within striking distance of doing something about aging. Now, the difficulty there is that People have been terrified of aging since the beginning of civilization. And they have spent a lot of effort developing ways to put aging out of their minds and get on with their miserably short lives and make the best of it rather than being preoccupied by this terrible thing that's going to happen to them, right? Um, and they're very good at it. I mean, some people would say that the whole of religion is, you know, a, is part of that. But certainly you can say, like, you know, the, the, the crazy, crazy arguments that people give for claiming that aging is some kind of blessing in disguise, you know, things like, oh dear, well, how would we pay the pensions as if that was not a solvable problem, you know, or wouldn't dictators live forever? Um, or even, you know, argue, uh, pure philosophical ones like, doesn't death give meaning to life? I mean, honestly, the idea that anyone would take such things seriously makes no sense whatsoever, unless you look at it from a psychological perspective and you say, well, this is just a way of putting it out of our minds. And of course, another way of putting it out of our minds is to say it's inevitable, to actually you know, leverage the lack of any agreed rigorous definition of aging 
and to essentially pretend that aging is somehow woven into the fabric of the universe in such a way that unlike diseases, it is simply not, it's simply off limits to medicine, which again is complete nonsense. So these are the things we have to fix. Now, the good news is that over the past few years, the first step in that being fixed among the wider community has been taken. The first step is investment. Courageous, you know, um, innovative, pioneering investors whose goal, yes, they would like not to get sick when they get old, and they would also like other people not to get sick when they get old, but the main thing that they would like is to make money, okay? People like that have started to realize that this is no longer a pipe dream, that this really is coming, and they are starting to put their money where their mouth is, or where my mouth is. So I spend a lot of my time at, these, at this point simply interact, inter, interfacing with investors and um, you know, advising them and getting them to understand the field well enough to be able to make good investments. I spend a huge amount of my time just making introductions between investors and founders of startup companies that have got good ideas in this space, or for that matter, between investors and other investors, so as to form consortia. So, so, so yeah, can you share... Bigger. Can you share a little bit? Um, we have investors sometimes listening uh, to this well, all the time, actually. But so we have startups and we have investors. Can you share what you share in those conversations? Uh, which founders are interesting right now? What investors are interesting? So it's really getting big. So now it's you know it covers the whole spectrum. We've got you know seed investors who are, who are interested in writing you know six digit checks to. Um, small startup companies that have really just begun. We've got that all the way through to institutional investors and venture funds. Um, you know, every style is, exists now. Some of the leading companies in this space that have only existed for a few years have already gone public. Um, that may actually be premature because, you know, it's an emerging sector. Uh, but certainly, of course, that's the goal in any, in any sector that companies will go public when they succeed well enough. However, um, you know, there's a huge amount of opportunity to invest in companies that are still small, still have you know, seven-digit valuations and um, are doing really exciting things and are going to be absolutely huge quite soon. Um, the uh, fact that you have to know a bit about the sector in order to be able to make a sensible and wise investment is, of course, a large part of the reason why investors will come to me uh, you know, to get some kind of advice. It also is the reason why investors tend to uh, aggregate into consortia of some kind in order to make the best of this. The, um, you know, the sector is growing so fast that kind of you can't lose. If you just take a lot of shots on goal, make a lot of small investments covering a diverse air range of, of technologies, you're going to do well. And you know, more and more investors are realizing that at this point. So, so can you share what you actually um, tell the investors that they need to be aware of? And can you also share some cool startups and what they are doing? Sure. Well, of course, what I start with is not by telling investors things, but by asking, because different investors are different, right? They'll have different check sizes they want to write, different risk profiles they want to look at. Um, uh, some of them will want to be lead investors. Some of them will explicitly not want to be lead investors. Some of them will know a bunch about the biology of aging or at least biology in general already, or they'll have people who do. Some of them won't. So, for example, in many cases, I will advise people to invest, so to speak, one step removed by, invest, by, by um, contributing to a venture fund where the due diligence, both on the science and on the... Um, business side is being done by people who have the right domain expertise. You know, it varies from one to another. But yeah, I can certainly go through a few. In fact, where I should probably start is with Sense Research Foundation itself, because we, as I mentioned at the beginning of the interview, we are a non-profit, a 501c3 public charity. But ever since this started to happen, and investors started to get interested, we have essentially adopted a business model where what we do is we take a really early stage project that we think is really important, but it's like so early that it's not investable. And we work on it for as long as it takes to develop the proof of concept to the point where at least in the eyes of some investors, it is investable. And at that point, we'll spin that project out into a startup company 
And of course, that will allow it to attract a lot more money than what we could provide philanthropically. So we've done that half a dozen times already. We did two last year. And, uh, you know, it's going to happen more and more. Let me so give you're one like example. a medical tech incubator. Uh, well, we're not quite an incubator yet. Um, we kind of, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to call it an incubator in the narrow sense that, in, uh, that, that investors would tend to use the term. So in fact, we may create an incubator that's a kind of for-profit partner of Sense Research Foundation uh, in the next few months. But right now, um, yeah, we incubate projects rather than companies. Um, and yeah, we absolutely, we take them far enough along that they can become companies. So let me give one example of this just to get the idea along. So the number one killer in the Western world is, of course, atherosclerosis. That's the accumulation of fatty deposits in the arteries that eventually leads to heart attacks and strokes. And the main reason it happens is because the body gets progressively less good at processing cholesterol. The last part of why that happens is because of the accumulation of contaminants in certain types of white blood cell. These contaminants are essentially oxidation derivatives of cholesterol. So spontaneous chemical reactions happen that turn cholesterol into slightly modified forms that white blood cells are unable to handle in the way that they handle normal cholesterol. And that uh, needs to be fixed. So we spun out a company that has some great technology for selectively removing this oxidized cholesterol from atherosclerotic plaques and from cells so that cells are no longer poisoned by it and can get on and process the normal cholesterol in the right way. We believe that this is a way to cause atherosclerotic plaques to regress and shrink and thereby to avoid um, getting into a state where they cause heart attacks and strokes. That's just one example of what we're doing. And that company was spun out last year uh, from Sense. We just, you know, we developed some IP and filed some patents and we just transferred that IP into the company. Obviously, we took a small equity stake in the company ourselves, um, but only a small one because we don't want to dilute other investors. And sure enough, they were able to raise a seed round that's very acceptable, and they'll be raising a Series A this year. Do you have other examples? I'm very sure, interested Sure, absolutely. In so um, the other example from last year was also actually re in relation to uh, the aging of the circuitry system. But this one is an interesting one because it, uh, the same technology is applicable cosmetically. So here we're talking about arteriosclerosis, which is the hardening of the arteries, nothing to do with cholesterol. This is to do with the accumulation of new unwanted chemical bonds that link together the proteins that give the major arteries their elasticity. So the elasticity of the arteries is really important in order to, if you like, buffer the heartbeat and uh, allow the heart to pump blood around the uh, circuitry system efficiently. If the major arteries become stiffer, then they can't do that so well. And so this is a part of why we get high blood pressure in the elderly. Uh, so the thing is, these chemical bonds that I just mentioned, these unwanted ones that accumulate over time, they have a very different chemical structure than anything that the body lays down on purpose. So what we've done is we've identified ways to break those bonds selectively and thereby restore the elasticity of these, uh, of this, of these artery walls. Um, and that has been spun out of the company. Now, I mentioned cosmetics. The thing is that the exact same chemistry is also responsible for loss of elasticity of the skin because we have the same kinds of proteins in the skin that um, suffer the same kinds of chemical reactions. And if we can do that, if we can restore the elasticity of the skin, then of course we ha we're, we're addressing the cause of wrinkles, which uh, might have a bit of a market, really, even though it's not life-threatening. <laughs> so uh, we spun out that technology of the company last year as well. Another one that we spun out a little earlier, a few years ago, um, is focused on macular degeneration, the number one cause of blindness in the elderly. So that's driven by the accumulation in the back of the eye of a chemical that's the kind of byproduct of vitamin A, and um, it's not digestible by the cells that accumulate it. So it accumulates eventually to a very large amount, like 20% of the total weight of the cells, and they can't handle that, so they die, and you go blind. So again, we are giving those cells the ability to break down that substance so that they continue to function. 
Can you name the names of the startups that you just mentioned? Sure. So the, fir the first one, the atherosclerosis one, is called Underdog Pharmaceuticals. The second one that's to do with cross-linking in the skin and in the arteries is called Revel, R-E-V for Victor, E-L, Pharmaceuticals. And the third one, the one that works on macular degeneration, is called ICOR, I-C-H-O-R. Actually, the um, ICOR is now diversified quite a bit into doing a bunch of different areas of aging, and the subsidiary of ICOR that works on macular degeneration is called Lysoclear, L-Y-S-O, clear. Great. Thank you for sharing. So if I'm uh, understanding correctly and what is happening now with, with, the, with the Research Institute Foundation now, so you guys are, it sounds to me like these founders that come to you, they're, are they university students or bioengineers? Like what type of profile usually comes to you and how do they find you? We have every kind of thing you can imagine. I mean, we go to them as well. So investors come to us, but also if we see investors that seem to be saying interesting things online, we'll reach out to them. And when it comes to scientists, you know, I began in this way. Right from the beginning, my interest was in making sure not only that I had good ideas for what technology needed to be developed to bring aging under control, but also that the very best people in the world, the world leaders in the relevant domain were actually keen to work on it and that turned out to be fairly straightforward uh, you know scientists like doing interesting stuff um, of course the third problem which was to actually pay them so that they had the resources with which to work on it that was the hard part and it still is but um, yeah that's what we do we're interested in uh, in getting this to happen and of course a large part of why I do so much media and get out there in the public eye a lot is so that people will come to me uh, so that, you know, whether it's youngsters or whether it's scientists, uh, that we create the right kind of, ent of environment and ecosystem so that the best work gets done. So we have a lot of startups. Um, we've actually had a lot of health startups pass through as well. Um, I can imagine somebody hearing this and thinking, I have the solution. I don't know who to turn to. Europe seems to me at least quite a reserved market when it comes to this. Um, I don't know what your experience is on that. Um, so what do these founders um, have to do in order to qualify? How is the process like once they are qualified and go through what you do? How long is that process? Well, of course, it, it, there's no one size fits all here. There's you know a very personalized thing depending on the technology, depending on the team, depending on how attractive they are to investors, but very much it's a global enterprise. So you're quite right. There are some aspects of the process that are more difficult in Europe and elsewhere in the world than in the US. There are some aspects that are easier in, for example, Asia than they are in the US. Um, so, you know, you have to like pick the right t trajectory for your uh, for your technology that what is future. easier in europe and what is easier in the u.s well so the regulatory process in the u.s is sometimes tricky because it you know involves the fda having to approve something and very often the fda will be overly focused on ensuring that something has been proven to be uh, more effective than what existed before Sometimes that will delay um, the approval of something uh, bef bef more longer than it should. Europe is quite often uh, happy to focus on just ensuring that the drug, the new therapy, is safe, and whether it really is more effective than what existed before can be shown after the drug has actually been approved. Um, conversely. When it comes to tech transfer, if something has been created in the university system, the US university systems tend to be much more sophisticated and cooperative when it comes to figuring out how to share the, you know, the intellectual property and make sure that everyone benefits if a project and technology eventually gets all the way through to making revenue. Uh, whereas the European market, the European university systems are to some extent still catching up and learning how to do that. Then, of course, in the Far East, there is very often a, a, a good deal more um, leniency, so to speak. You know, it's not quite so um, fastidious with regard to safety. Uh, and sometimes you can get things through clinical trials faster there. But it's an ecosystem. And of course, the same applies to investors. So you highlighted earlier how tech investors 
uh, often kind of understand this market better. But that's by no means the whole story. There are investors from Europe, there are investors from the UK, there are increasing now investors from Southeast Asia. You know, so it's a global enterprise. And um, do you feel like the hub would be Silicon Valley because that's where you are? Uh, the hub of some of it is at Silicon Valley, certainly. I mean, I feel that in many sectors and in many ways, Silicon Valley will, for the foreseeable future, be an absolutely unique place in the world. And a large part of what makes it so and what has made it so ever since the 50s and 60s is its attitude to failure. Here, you know, things are completely, normally, you know, anywhere else in the world, if you try something and you fail, then people who see this, see this will default to the assumption that you're not very good. Whereas in Silicon Valley, it's just not like that. If you try something and you fail, then the default assumption is that you're courageous enough to have tried something that was really hard and will give you another chance, right? Um, and, you know, that is why so many high-risk, high-reward things happen in Silicon Valley before they happen anybody else, anywhere else. You've got the right kind of mindset, the right kind of community of people who are totally willing to throw themselves into something that has quite a high chance of being completely unsuccessful. You know, makes all the difference. But, of course, you know, as a pioneering project moves forward and gets into the kind of de-risked, but still important and very expensive stage of moving all the way through the final stages to market, that will often require very different ways of thinking and ways of doing things. And by no means does Silicon Valley have a monopoly on that. Uh, one of the things that um, always interests me, we've had a couple of people from Silicon Valley actually come up, um, product designers. Um, we had Whipsaw Agency come on, uh, who pretty much develop a lot of um, Google's and Uber products. But uh, one of the things that interests me is what is Silicon Valley to you? Because I'm getting the feeling lately that Silicon Valley isn't just Silicon Valley. It's like in San Francisco, people have their headquarters. Uh, then there's like other places in California that they're moving to. So if a startup is moving from Europe to, to California, wanting to go into that area that you've mentioned, where are we talking? Which places should they be moving to? I would say that at this point, for sure, the Bay Area is stronger in biotech in general and certainly in anti-aging biotech than the rest of California, let alone the rest of the U.S. Um, there's just like at every level, whether it's the founders and the companies, whether it's the investors, there's just more people who have the sophistication and the skills and the interest in uh, prioritizing this. So I would definitely say come to San Francisco Bay Area. And, um, and then on, on the investor side, um, do you think it's necessary for an investor to open a headquarters in San Francisco or can they just stay in Europe and then maybe what you said, go through other venture capitalists or uh, how, what would you advise? <sighs> That's a tricky one. I, 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 I think as an investor, the more you know, the better, always. Because the more, you're, the more you don't know, the more you have to delegate and have middlemen, you know, who, of course, mean that you don't necessarily make so much money in any way and so on. So, you know, sure, the, uh, you know, of course, if, it's, if you're a venture fund or you're a global investor and you've got plenty of stuff, then having a, an office in San Francisco or if you're an individual just spending a bunch of time in San Francisco, you know, maybe a few months in the year will be better than not. Definitely. You'll meet more pe more of the right people. You'll have a better chance to capitalize on this. So uh, let's let's quickly, um, we have a lot of angels, actually, that, that pop up as well. So an angel is an individual investor comes. How would they approach it? Do they just, re are you guys, because you're a charity, are you just open to answer anybody's question? Or where do they go to? Is there some type of startup hub specifically? four days what do they do if they've never been to san francisco right so of course the answer to this question is a bit different during the pandemic so let me give an answer that kind of assumes that either we're talking before the pandemic or we're talking once everything's back under control and and we can actually have reasonably unrestricted travel and interaction well let's uh yeah let's actually cover both during the pandemic what they can do maybe virtually as well um to to prepare themselves but also once everything calms down 
Sure, absolutely. But let me deal with the uh, situation once everything comes down first. Yeah. Because, you know, so much of business, so much of every walk of life revolves around unanticipated interactions. You know, just being in the right place at the right time and meeting the right person over a beer and having the right conversation to give yourself a new idea that you didn't have before. And a large part of how I was able to be as effective and influential as I am is because I was never shy of traveling. I was always everywhere and meeting people and just you know, having the right interaction. Um, there's just more of us over here than there are anywhere else. So of course there are meetups, there are conferences, there are you know there's everything. Um, any any big ones uh, that you care to mention? Uh, well, uh, sure. Uh, where do I start? Um, uh, let's start at the biology end. So there are a number of universities in the Bay Area that have big interest in the biology of aging. The result is that they have come together to form something called the Bay Area Aging Meeting, which happens twice a year brings together all the scientists that are involved. A lot of it is focused on early stage ideas that are being presented by young scientists, PhD students and so on. Um, and so if you're already reasonably sophisticated about biotech so that you can understand a science lecture, then um, you, know, you should come along to something like that. Then there are um, incubators, uh, some of them really well known. Y Combinator, for example, happens to have its main office literally 100 yards from our main office down in Mountain View. Um, Uh, they're very interested in this space. Um, they've invested in it. Uh, there's, there are other incubators and accelerators doing the same thing. There are venture funds focused here. So, of course, if one is interested in investing indirectly, then one can actually go and visit these people and you know, sit down with them for an hour or two, and that will be a great deal more intensive and effective in bringing one up to speed than just reading about them. Um, If we move on to the scenario right now when there's so little traveling going on, of course, conferences are still happening. Most of the conferences that used to happen are still happening in this space. It's just they're happening online. And people are pretty much getting the hang of this, of how to make those things work. I'm certainly doing just as much public speaking as ever at meetings like that. Um, uh, and so are many of my colleagues. So, you know, that's another way to learn. Another example of this, just to highlight the range of things that are available, is there's a group called the Longevity Investor Network, which is a bunch of upwards of 100 um, investors who are signed up to a mailing list that, is, um, that, that does a monthly webinar where a couple of companies will typically you know, pitch, you know, make short presentations. That has been very effective, not only in getting such companies um, their seed funding, but also in bringing investors together with each other to identify the right way for them to go. That sounds uh, actually really interesting and specific. Thank you for sharing that. Um, a question that, that popped up um, as well that I really wanted to ask is, what does somebody who does not have an engineering degree or is a biologist, how can they contribute to this space? Can they contribute or is it really just for engineers and biologists and researchers? Yeah, people write to me all the time saying, what can I do? And of course, you're absolutely right. A lot of people, you know, can't do those things. If you are a biologist, of course, you want to make sure that you work in the best, most impactful area. You don't want to be doing stuff that's irrelevant. Similarly, if you're a wealthy individual, whether you want to be philanthropic or as an investor, then you want to find out the best place to write your check to. Um, You know, we're always short of money and we have a nice friendly donate button on our um, website. And of course, we very much welcome grassroots donations as well from people who are not billionaires, but who can maybe contribute, you know, $100 a month. Uh, can can you say the website one more time? So sure. Sense.org. I'm sure you'll put it in the, in the notes, right? Um, yeah. But S for sugar, E for elephant, N for November, S for sugar, dot O-R-G. Um, So, yeah, that's, that's important. And people will often say, oh, you know, well, I can donate, won't make any difference. That's not true at all. The more people donate, it all adds up. Plus, also, I always point out that the less wealthy you are, the more people you know who are wealthier than you. So you can, you know, you can always uh, trickle it up and encourage other people to do more than you can yourself. And, of course, that applies more generally. Um, advocacy is critically important here. I mean, you're doing something big right now that didn't require an engineering degree, namely, you're interviewing me. 
uh, you're al allowing more people to have a proper understanding and perspective on what this field is and where it's going and how quickly it's going. And that is what it takes to make the field go faster by enthusing more people, getting more people to be willing to actually help. Uh, it applies at the government level as well. You know, um, public funding is still by far the major source of financial support for early stage work. And also for the companies, the startups? For early stage work, yeah. I think the, if you look at the accumulated size of the investment that goes in from venture funds and angel investors and so on, you know, it's a lot bigger than it was and it's going up all the time, but it's still dwarfed by what goes in from government. And therefore, it's a bit of a problem that what goes in from government is so poorly directed, so poorly prioritized. But the reason it's poorly prioritized, of course, is because at the end of the day, the decisions are made by people who only have one priority in life, namely getting re-elected. And that means that public policy is inevitably only going to follow public opinion rather than to lead public opinion. So public opinion has to change first. And that's why me doing interviews, other, other people doing interviews, and so on, and generally educating the world and getting them past this fear of getting their hopes up that is underpinning the irrationality that exists today, you know, that is so important. So many questions pop up. Uh, one of the, the quick ones, that, or depending on how your answer is, how does politics affect the anti-aging community? Obviously, Trump, Obama would have been different, I assume. How has it affected you guys and your research and the projects you've worked on? Well, not so much, to be honest. So if we look at uh, you know, perhaps the slightly longer history of political um, influence on research in the US, of course, one of the biggest things that happened over the past 20 or 30 years was the period when there was a restriction on funding for embryonic stem cell research. Um, now, that was under that, the Bush presidency, right? That's right. Now, of course, that is history. Um, and the reason it's history is partly because of changes of administration, but mostly it's because of improvements in technology. We basically just don't need embryonic stem cells for anything anymore because we've got this new thing that was developed originally in Japan called induced pluripotent stem cells, which are more or less the same, but can be created without destroying embryos. So uh, what, um, what is that exactly? I've never heard of it. Oh, okay. Well, so in 2006, a Japanese group figured out that you could take regular cells that were not stem cells, and you could give them four particular factors, four particular proteins, that would essentially drive their developmental clock backwards, so that they would become very similar to, not completely identical, but very similar to embryonic stem cells. They would behave kind of the same way, and you could use them in the same ways. So they um, reversed aging on those cells? Well, don't really call it reversing aging, reverse development. So what happens in normal cells, and we want it to happen, is that they start out being extremely versatile, being able to do a whole bunch of different things. But in fact, they are, can't really do a whole bunch of different things. Rather, they can turn themselves into a bunch of other types of cells that can do different things. And we need that to happen. You know, the early embryo has, has a bunch of these very versatile cells, but they need to what's called differentiate into lineages that make particular organs and make different cells doing different things. So when you look at an adult human, they don't have any of these really primitive cells. They have some cells that are more primitive than others, but that's all. And they don't have very many of the even slightly primitive ones. So the idea is to drive such cells backwards into a situation which is like the early embryo. And then you do a bunch of other things to them to make sure that they're actually doing what you want them to do and not doing what you don't want them to do. And then you can use them. And this is a neat way of sidestepping immune rejection because you can take cells from the person that you're originally going to get, you're eventually going to give these modified cells back to. And of course, I'm glossing over a million details here, <laughs> but that's the essential idea. And so continue, please, with the question before that about how politics has affected um, you guys. Right. So at the moment, there is an increasing amount of interaction between the anti-aging research community and the political world, the corridors of power, not just in the U.S., but also elsewhere, but especially in the U.S., actually. And the reason is because the science has moved sufficiently, and indeed the public exposure of the science has moved sufficiently, 
that this you know, that we can increasingly make a case that there might actually be votes in it. We can actually talk to elected people and uh, explain to them that it may actually be in their interests to start advocating for this research and start spending taxpayers' money on it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's still early. You know, even now I am giving talks that basically say, okay, we sorted out the science, you know, and we sorted out the investor community. That's kind of got a momentum of its own now. So now let's go for policymakers and really get them to understand that this is the thing to do. So that's been pretty much your career from what I understand and what you've been doing within Sense. It was just like changing people's minds so that they can start understanding that there's a problem and that it's time to start doing stuff. Sure. I mean, of course, I'm trained as a scientist, not as a public speaker or an advocate or, or a lobbyist or anything. And... For sure, the best way to change people's minds is to do experiments that make a difference. Of course, the definitive experiments that actually start to have people or even mice living a lot longer, that's not something you can do at once. You have to start out doing preliminary experiments that can be argued to be important stepping stones towards eventual improvement in healthy longevity. But those arguments are getting stronger and stronger with every year that goes by. So for sure it makes sense that Sense Research Foundation is a biomedical research charity and most of our money goes on actual bench work, actual people with white coats on, you know, manipulating pipettes and so on. But the work that I do personally is actually mostly the advocacy side. I mean, part of that is because as Sense Research Foundation has become more established, we've been able to recruit really, really good scientists. So I've been able to very, very largely delegate that part of my job to other people. Whereas on the advocacy side, you know, interviewers or conference organizers or whatever, they want the front man. You can't delegate that so easily. Um, but I'm, I don't resent that at all. You know, I've learned, I, I reckon I'm pretty good at public speaking and advocacy these days. I've been doing it long enough. Um, so I think that's fine. That, that that's where I can make the most difference. So that was actually really good um, that you covered that because I, I wanted to also for the listeners to know when, when they donate to you, where does the ma- money then actually go to? But you've kind of covered it because it goes to projects, the, yes. the ones that you've mentioned before, the early stage startups that are even earlier than early stage. You you guys use that money to develop those projects then. Now there's, there's one other aspect of our work which I ought to highlight as well, which is education. So... We have an education arm of the foundation, which trains people. Um, We have summer interns for a couple of months every year, about a dozen of them. We also have a few uh, longer term people, people who come to us for a whole year, generally immediately after they've got their undergrad degree. And this is, of course, extraordinarily important for training the next generation of, uh, you know, anti-aging pioneers and crusaders. In fact, a high proportion of... (coughs) A high proportion of the people who uh, come through that program stay in the field. They either actually take jobs with us or with our spin-out companies or in some other way they stay involved. And, you know, so that's very important. But a big thing, a big reason why I want to mention this is because it's inherently non-profit. It's not something that we're likely to be able to spin out the way we can spin out an individual project in, from research. So the... Um, as time goes on, the education part of our work will, I hope, be able to more and more take center stage in the nonprofit side of things. And I very much encourage people who understand the value of education to look at that. Of course, there's massive information about it on our website and to consider helping with that. We'd love to grow it further. At this point, let me tell you, the Summer Scholars Program that we have, our summer internship program, is 50-fold oversubscribed every year. Wow. We can fund two. We can only take two percent of our applicants. So it's literally it's harder to get into that program than it is to get into MIT, and that's because it's so attractive to people. So many people know that they are in the most important pioneering area that they could possibly be in. So we get the most stellar people, and what that means, of course, is that we could totally add an entire digit to our budget for the education initiative, and we would not really reduce the quality of the people we bring in by anything. 
it sounds so similar yet we're in so different worlds uh, but it sounds so similar to our mission which is our mission statement is sharing innovation for the next generations for future generations and what you mentioned is it, that knowledge transfer towards future uh, generations it, it sounds so interesting is there also a digital academy for for those that don't get accepted for the summer applicants uh, kind of so um we definitely do our very best to help everybody to find the best way to contribute to this mission and to make a difference and a lot of that will involve putting people in touch with professors for example helping people to choose the right course to do depending on what stage they're at yeah so we do our very best to help everybody to, to, to make the most of themselves so is there actually on your website somewhere where they can follow like a course or sure i mean i mean sure there's masses of stuff like that um I mean, the most important thing, of course, is we have a contact form. You can actually write us and say, listen, I want to help. I'm this person. I have this background. Uh, I have these skills. What can I do? Yeah. So, I mean, with that kind of, uh, we, we're about to wrap up. Um, some final questions that I had was, if people are getting introduced to this, uh, what kind of books um, should they read? What kind of things should they check out? What can you advise them? So our website is really good for this. It has material in it for absolutely everybody from the most um, high-end high domain experts all the way through to complete novices. Um, but of course, there is my own book. I wrote a book called Ending Aging some time ago. Um, it was, it's actually more than a decade old now, but don't worry about that because even though there has been so much progress over that decade, nevertheless, the progress has been more or less what I said it was going to be. Uh, so the book is still pretty up to date in terms of actually orienting a newcomer to what's really going on and what matters in this field. Uh, you know, there are other books that are coming out all the time, some of them based on um, more on, you know, how a post-aging world is going to look and how it's going to work. Some of the others based on the science. My friend David Sinclair, who's another prominent person in this area, brought out a book just last year called um, how we, Why We Age and Why We Don't Have To which is a nice provocative title. The more people come out with authority like myself and David and say provocative things like that, the, the faster we will progress. And then any podcasts or something to check out? Uh, so we don't have a regular podcast, but I do podcasts everywhere all the time. You know, go to my Twitter feed and see them. Go to the Central Foundation Twitter feed. Uh, you know, we've we've got interviews. I give interviews all the time. And, of course, I cover up-to-date stuff. Do you also have a newsletter on the on the sense? We do. We have a newsletter that you can sign up to. It comes out every month. Perfect. Okay. Well, I mean, we've had so much information from you. I'm super grateful for this. And I think a lot of people, whether they're startups or investors, even interns, I guess, uh, know what to do now. And uh, I'm super grateful that you've been on. Maybe some last words to the listeners that you have? Sure. I mean, first of all, thank you for listening. This has been quite a long interview. And I'm delighted if you've been able to uh, maintain your interest for it. And I very much want to help you to help me. I want people to get involved in this. And as I've said, you don't need to be a biologist. You don't need to be a billionaire. Everybody can make a contribution. Just remember that more than 70% of all deaths that happen worldwide are down to aging. And of course, it's not just the deaths, it's also the enormous amount of disease and debilitation and decrepitude and dependence and general misery that precedes it. So this is the world's most important problem. We are now finally, after all these millennia, we are within striking distance of finally actually bringing it under control and eliminating it and allowing people to stay fully functional, both medically and both mentally and physically for as long as they live. And that is something that's worth contributing to. And on that note, I think we're going to close. Thank you so much uh, for being on. Well, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. If you like this episode, you can check out our most recent one here. And if you haven't already, make sure you click here to subscribe and see the next one. But if you're interested in more tips and tricks, then make sure to join our Facebook group where you can find thousands of like-minded people and you get direct access and support to any business question from the entire startup funding event team.